Hey friends. All right. This is something new for us. I haven't ever done anything like this before. You know, we're in the middle of the study on the uh, ruthless elimination of hurry. And what I've told you is that once a week, I'm going to get together with somebody that I know and somebody that I just really value their thoughts. And we're going to talk through some of the parts of this book together. So today I am happy to tell you that I am with my good friend, Sean Acor. So Sean, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. So Sean, if you don't know him, you should, you should know Sean. So Sean is a leader in the area of positive psychology, which has everything to do with the science of happiness. In fact, he's one of the leading voices in that area and one of the people who really popularized um, this, this field with a TED Talk that he did a few years ago that became one of the most viewed TED Talks of all time. He then wrote a book called The Happiness Advantage, which is a great book that lots and lots of people have benefited from. And then his most recent book is called Big Potential, which is a book that our staff read a couple of years ago that has had a big impact on our staff. So if you don't know Sean's work, I'd start with the TED Talk and then go out um, from there. Well, I'd start with this with this conversation first and then do the TED Talk. And then um, some of his, his other work and his, his books are really, really helpful. And um, perhaps least uh, impressively of everything that I've said. Uh, Sean's also one of my good friends. So he is just a dear friend um, to me. And uh, his wife, uh, Michelle, uh, Amy, uh, is good friends with her and we're a couple friends. And I'm just really, really grateful that Sean's taking the time to talk with us about this book. Our conversation about the book actually began when he and I both read it. I read it probably in January, February, Sean. It was about that time when you read it too, right? Yeah, you, you were the one who recommended it to me. Okay, okay. And um, we had some conversations around it then, so we'll touch on some of those things with some new stuff also. So before we uh, dive into the book, Sean, anything else uh, about you and kind of your area of expertise to be helpful as we jump in? No, I, I think that's it. That was great. That was a great introduction. I, I, I kind of covered it. Yeah, that's it. Okay, great. Um, all right, so Sean, um, give me just a little bit of um, your thoughts on the correlation between hurry, which is what this book is all about, and stress, and then happiness, which is you know your area of research. As you've researched, what, what kind of connection have you seen between hurry and happiness? I think it's a fascinating one. That's why I was uh, I love the idea of the book um, when we first started, when you suggested it, and I started reading it um, because I. I think we all feel it within our lives. I feel like we all feel this time famine where you know we have so many things going on within our lives. Um, we we feel starved for you know time with our spouses or time with our kids because we have so much going on. I mean, even Netflix. I mean, all the things we have to do on Netflix alone, much less you know HBO and all the other ones we're supposed to be watching. I'm so behind just on those shows. I don't even have time for my for my kids or <laughs> anything. So you need more like, Cobra Kai and then you'll get to Leo and Zoe. Exactly. Right. It's yeah. order of operations. Once I take right. care of Netflix, then more Netflix will come out. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, what I find so fascinating, so at the heart of my research, um, for, for those of you that don't know my research, um, is I got fascinated by looking at what happens when a brain becomes more positive. And when it's in a positive state, what we find is that the more positive it becomes, from your genes and from the way you've been living your life, um, all of your business and educational outcomes start improving. So I got fascinated by this idea that happiness becomes this advantage in people's lives. Um, but what was interesting is that's not the way that we live our lives, right? We don't think, oh, happiness is gonna fuel my success. We think once I'm successful, then I can start feeling happier, right? Um, so there's this formula that I talk a lot about in my book that we all use in our parenting, um, in our personal development, as we you know, lead companies or work with other people on teams, we think if I work harder and achieve this goal, then I'll feel happier, right? So I will feel happy when. So the problem with that formula is it's scientifically broken and backwards for two reasons. I mean, one reason is, um, and this was, this was crucial when I first started understanding this, um, to, it, it transformed so much of my life. It was such a simple uh, recognition, but every time your brain has a success, your brain changes the goalpost of what success looks like, right? Otherwise, the very first time you put Legos together as a four-year-old, you would have been done in terms of success, right? <laughs> you're like, yeah. if I ask you if you're successful today, you're like, yeah, put those blocks together. <laughs> what else do I need to do? Um, but we want our brain to keep 
raising the bar of success, right? That's allowed us to live for thousands of years, right? As a species, um, it's allowed us to, uh, you know, overcome challenges. It's how we go from addition to multiplication to, you know, leading families. Um, the problem comes when we put happiness on the opposite side of that success, right? We th keep thinking, oh, wow. how will yeah. happy win? That's where it dovetailed with this book. Because to me, hurry is, if I can hurry to some other place in the world or other state, then I'll feel happier. It's the same formula that we've been using that like if I, you know, once I graduate from high school, think how happy I'll be. I mean, once I get into college, you know, and then you're like, wait, I don't even have a job. <laughs> right? So then you get a job and then you do well. And then we raise our goals for that job or we want a promotion or we want to hit higher targets or we want to have a bigger church or more followers. Right. And in the midst of all of this, we keep thinking, you know, I'll be happy. Maybe I'll be happy when I get married, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. I don't be happy all the time. I remember saying that one. Um, or like once, then you have kids and then you want them to be happy. The problem is we keep thinking happiness will happen at some point X in the future, which is what hurry is all about, right? We wouldn't be hurrying if the future is much worse than the present, right? We're trying to get to some place where we feel like happiness will happen in the future. So I, I thought from the very beginning, this whole idea of the ruthless elimination of hurry um, fits so well with this concept of stopping this formula that doesn't work. Because what we found is success doesn't yield higher levels of happiness like we thought it would. Um, if your success rates rise for the next five years, your happiness levels flatline. They don't move very much. But if you flip it around, if we raise your levels of happiness now, if you're more mindful, if you're more peaceful, if you're more optimistic, you're most socially connected, all of your success rates rise. So this book about hurry was the same type of idea, right? It was this idea that stop thinking about, well, part of, part of the reason we hurry is because we think we're going to get to someplace off in the future. And if that mm -hmm. doesn't ne necessarily, necessarily guarantee us happiness, then we've got the formula wrong and we need to rethink the hurry that we're currently doing. That's really good. So the fact that the goalpost keeps moving further and further back is not in and of itself a bad thing. That's what aspires us to constantly get better, to achieve new things, all of that, right? Yeah. One of the things that I've said is that um, every new position that I've been in, I've always felt like I, like my, my head was underwater, right? But I, I've gotten taller each time, you know? So you, 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 just, you get kind of more experience, you get better and better at things, you're able to achieve more. So that in and of itself is not the problem. The problem is, is that when we think, once my head's above water or once I can reach that goalpost, that's when happiness will come. Right. And I mean, look what 2020 did to that yeah. expectation, right? I kept thinking to myself, if I can just get off the road, I was traveling every three days before the pandemic doing this research and, and talking. And I was like, I just need my life to be less fragmented. If I can get off the road for a little bit and just spend more time with my, think how happy I'll be. Like, I'll write more books, I'll spend more time with my family, I'll do all this nature stuff. And then you realize that like, you get into a place like the pandemic, and then you're like, as soon as the pandemic is over, think how happy I'm gonna be. <laughs> then, I'll, then I'll be happy. Oh, that's when I can so travel, good, and when I can go out and do all this work and see people, yeah. right? Like, so it was almost like in none of the, in no environment or circumstance was I in the place where I thought, yes, this is it. Now, finally, my head's above water, and now I can make all the spiritual progress and social progress. Um, I wonder if we're, as human beings, we're in a constant state where we realize that um, our ability to succeed rises over time um, as we learn new skill sets and get better at things. I wonder if it's part and parcel of, of a meaningful life that will have a lot more thrown at us. Um, I remember... Uh, I, I just remember this, but I remember uh, when I was back in academia, I really wanted to be a tenured professor someday. I thought that was it. Like that's the, that's the pinnacle, like there's movie stars and then there's tenured professors. Um, yeah, that's what you, I have never thought that in my entire life. <laughs> no, no it, it's ridiculous. And, uh, but I talked to a tenured professor and he was like, yeah, you work really hard as a student so you can go to graduate school. And then you work really hard, even harder then, so that you can uh, uh, achieve enough so that you can become an assistant professor somewhere. And then you work really hard so you could get tenured so you can write a book. And then you find yourself on more committees than you've ever been in your entire life. And run. So the busiest you'll ever be is when you become a tenured professor, right? And I'm wow. like, I'm already busy now. I'm like a freshman in college, right? right? And it was almost as if 
our power as it grows, we keep wanting to add on more, which makes sense, right? If I'm, if you're helping somebody at a church or somebody's helping somebody at work or in a nonprofit, like it's easy to think, you know, I help two people today. What would tomorrow look like if I was helping four people? Yeah, the world definitely right. needs it. So there's nothing wrong with that, right? We want right. to help more people. The question is where that there's got to be some sort of asymptote where as you approach um, more success, you also hit this wall where our hurry gets in the way of helping those one or two people we were helping today. Yeah, that's really, really good. Yeah, when I grow up, I want to be a tenured professor. <laughs> that's right. I, so um, That's why dating was so hard. <laughs> There's so, comments so like good. that one. <laughs> so good. Yeah, did you lead with that on your first date? Oh, oh man. Yeah, yeah. I had so many other problems. <laughs> Everybody wants to go to prom with a future tenured professor. Right. Okay. Um, all right. So, you know, uh, Comer puts forth some really practical, you know, suggestions around what it looks like to, to slow down and especially around what does it look like to, to follow Jesus in this, this kind of you know, lifestyle that most of us are living? He talks about um, solitude and silence, Sabbath, um, slowing and simplicity. And I know one of the things that I, I love about your research is that you always couple it with really, really practical stuff also. I think that's, I think that's, that's part of what um, makes your stuff so incredibly helpful. So as you're thinking about this life that, that we're living that, that tends to be too fast, what are some of the practical things that you think about that either you know dovetail with some of the stuff that Comer's talked about or that you found in your research? Really practical stuff that we can do to slow down, live more where we are. And the derivative of that, of course, is, is, is joy and happiness, fulfillment, all those things. What's some practical stuff? Um, I think it starts with a mindset shift. I think that mindset shift is embedded within our hurry is meaning, right? I hurry because I want... Uh, to impact more people's lives. That's good, right? So if that's first and foremost my thought, I also have to look to see is hurry getting in the way of that, right? And what I'm finding is that that's actually oftentimes the case. So I think the first is a mindset shift of not this idea that that I need to eliminate all this, all the things that are going on in my life to find peace and joy. What I need to do is make sure that I'm finding the peace and joy that I've been hurrying for so much in my daily life. So. Mm -hmm. The brain is a pattern maker, right? And so one of the habits that we have people do, I, we were just talking about this, Matt, right before turning on the cameras that I was shooting all these videos for teachers. The last thing, my, my mom was a high school English teacher. The last thing I want to do to a teacher is to give her more work or him more work, right? Because right. I see how much work they're doing. They're in the classrooms and now they're cleaning the classrooms and then they have homework at night and then they're dealing mm -hmm. with parents and superintendents. Like there's so much on parents. Last thing I want to do is be like, hey, you should also meditate for three hours a night, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Um, so what I've been looking for is what are small changes they can make into their life? And one of the ones we've researched was simply, uh, we got people every day for two minutes a day that's it. So it is adding to their day. But for two minutes a day, we got them to just scan their day for one meaningful thing that happened over the past 24 hours. So it's something that already happened. They don't have to go out and create a meaningful experience. I think meaning's happening to us all the time. We're just not aware of it or we're not imbuing that moment with meaning. And so we got people to scan for meaning in the midst of that day. So it might be a conversation you have with your kids in the midst of all the other hurry you have, or it might be like, one really good email or something that just was an aha moment that you saw on on social media or a podcast but we got people for two minutes to just write about that one uh, that one experience so they write about yeah. what they were thinking about what they said where they were the reason that's so important is your brain only needs one known of, node of meaning to adjudge that day as meaningful right so oh, wow okay the reason why that's helpful and your brain's a pattern maker, right? So if you do this over a period of, say, 21 days in a row, your brain connects the dots for you, right? So you start to see this trajectory of meaning running throughout your life in the midst of the hurry. And the hurry could be just loss of activity, loss of meaningful activity. But in the midst of the hurry, we might not be accessing the meaning that was there. So simply what we're getting people to do is by adding two minutes a day, they're actually scanning for and making sure that their brain recorded that that event was meaningful. Because if we don't, it's really powerful, right? Yeah. So, so we only need our brains only need kind of one, you know, one you call it a node of of meaning a day. 
Meaning that if we can reflect on our day and find one thing that was meaningful, that was purposeful, it, it, it allows our brains to kind of recognize that today, today was a win. Like I, there, there, was, there was something today of, of value. And if we can kind of redeem that out of each day, then it, it builds into our brain this pattern of recognizing, you know, my, my life does have meaning. It does have purpose. Not just, not just something I'm hoping for, but here and, here and now, today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like, it's almost like uh, kids when they come home from high school and their parents ask them, how, are you, how was your day? They're like, yeah. fine. It's like they've lumped it all into fine, nothing really happened, <laughs> right? Yeah. But then you actually scan into it and they probably had a conversation that was meaningful or they got a piece of praise back or they shot three three-pointers in a row, whatever it is. If you look into their day that their brain just lumped all together as not meaningful, there were these moments of meaning that our brains can miss out on if, if we don't see how beautiful life is. So part of what we're trying to do is that in the midst of 24 hours, you're going to have 24 hours of activity, including sleep, regardless of who you are, right? You're going to still have that. The question is, was that time meaningfully spent? And I could be like, at the end of my day, tell Michelle, you know, she's like, how's your day? I could be like, yeah, I did a lot of emails, right? And I did. And probably a lot of them were not meaningful, right? But one or two of them probably were, right? Like I got a positive note from a teacher that said that this was helpful, right? Or, you know, I wrote to this kid who wrote in and who is struggling with their, their, their own writing, right? And I proved somebody else's life. So I, to connect to this, and maybe it's too tangential, but I'll just mention it. I saw this article from the Atlantic um, that talked about how um, loneliness isn't the lack of people around you. It's the lack of feeling like you have a meaningful impact upon people. I think the reason oh, that we that's good. Lament, yeah. Yeah, I think the reason we lament hurry is because we feel like we're doing so much we aren't getting what we're supposed to out of life, right? Mm -hmm. Which is meaning and connection to God and love for others. And I think those are occurring over the course of the day. Our brain's just not accessing them. So if we took 2 minutes a day to access that through prayer or journaling or talking about with your kids around the dinner table, you might actually in the midst of all the activity actually feel like you're not hurrying as much as you thought you were. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, and I love the intentionality that you're talking about with this. I mean, I, I, it's so easy for me to do that with Amy, to just kind of give her a report on the day, which is typically really short and involves kind of, you know, the, the high points of my day. Um, but then if I actually sit and like you talk about scan for meaning, I'm going to find stuff. So that doesn't have to be a, a solo uh, exercise, right? But it doesn't mean necessarily you're sitting by yourself for 120 seconds scanning. You can do that with other people, right? And you can, you can it, for those of us that are parents, we can lead our children in that. Yeah, I think it's even more powerful when we're doing it with other people because it yeah. becomes this tapestry of your conversation, right? The meaning involved with your lives where, you know, they did this study, this was on gratitude, but they did this study uh, early on where they got people, spouses at night, um, to say three things that they were grateful for, just basically to say three things that were good about their day or that, you know, uh, maybe even those me meaningful, but at least good, right? Um, turns yeah. out when they did this, it makes people more optimistic. That's all the research we could talk about another time. But what was funny was six months later, after doing this with your spouse, you actually report your spouse as being physically more attractive than they were six months previously. So oh, but that never wow. happens. I need, right? I you need to six give months. like six gratitudes a night. Yeah, Amy's exactly. More I need than three to start seeing me as attractive. This is this is good. How would it, you should tell Amy about this. <laughs> and what's great about it is it works for both. And the reason for that is is because not only are you changing your lens for the world, where you're able to scan for the positive in your spouse more more readily. But the cool thing is you're hearing all these meaningful parts about their day, which is where I thought I could link back in. You're hearing these three things from Amy that you might not have heard in the midst of the hurry of life, right? Like you're just trying to get the kids to sleep and you're trying to get your work done and you're getting everything. And you might not have heard something that happened in their life, which those positive things are what make people even more attractive in our eyes, right? So I think that when we do it as, you know, as spouses and partners, when we do that as families sitting around the dinner table, you know, what we're doing is we're not just hearing about what happened at school, but we're reframing that narrative to be meaningful. And that same dinner you're gonna have anyway, that might seem rushed because you're putting food on the table, you might spend two minutes having a meaningful experience and felt like you bond with your kids, which is the whole point of the day, right? Oh, that's um, so good. That's so good. And, and, and it gets into something else I wanted to ask you about because me slowing down, being more intentional with my life, reflecting all of that stuff is good for me. 
but we're also kind of you know dipping our toe in this water it's also good for the people around me right it's also better for other people if, if i'm moving at a less uh less rapid pace and you've told me before with this incredible study about people that are that, that are rushing and what that kind of hurry does to our to our levels of compassion can you share that story yeah this is incredible so these two researchers at princeton um, decided to uh, test at Princeton Theological Seminary how hurry has an impact upon our spiritual life and how much we love other people. They designed this brilliant study, and in the study, they basically had people that were in the theological seminary who were training to become pastors, right, um, read the Good Samaritan story. So these are already people who want to give their life to God, who are reading a story, the Good Samaritan, about how we should care for and help other people and then they put them into three categories where they were going to have people in a preparation room prepare a sermon and then they were supposed to walk across campus along this one certain path and there was a recording studio where their supervisors would be judging how they performed right on the sermon uh so the three categories were they and, had and it's a sermon on the good samaritan right on the good samaritan okay. so they're priming yeah. their brain reading about it they're writing out a sermon about how to help people and they've already dedicated themselves to God, right? And they have to go across campus to give a sermon and from, and from their peers and supervisors. So there's three categories. There's a category where they say, uh, you're running behind, a few minutes behind right now. We need you to get over to the recording studio as quickly as you possibly can. There's a second category where they say, uh, we're right on time. If you could just go on over, the recording studio is ready for you. And the third category is, you're actually a few minutes ahead, um, but uh, as you walk across campus, they'll be ready, you know, a, a few minutes after you arrive there. Okay. So it's a high hurry, intermediate hurry, low hurry condition. I and feel like all, you psychologists are messing with us pastors. I feel like, I feel like you're like playing time. with us. So, exactly. All the time. <laughs> right. And so here's what they, here's what happens. They walk across campus in these three conditions and brilliantly, they put a confederate. Confederate is somebody who is an undercover researcher along the path in a alleyway um, which is gonna be important in a second, and they uh, fall over and they're sick, right? They're like, they're coughing, they're clearly in distress, they're hurting and they're blocking the alleyway. 63% um, of the people that are reading the Good Samaritan story who see this person walking across campus and they go through this alley, stop to help this person. So 63% of them stop to help in, in the low hurry category. In the high hurry category, 90% literally step over the oh. person that's hurting and distressed in the alleyway. That's why they put them in the alleyway, because they literally have to walk over the person to go oh, give I the didn't, sermon. I don't think you had told me that part. That's no, I just read that this morning. Over the, the, the victim, <laughs> who is actually a researcher, who's doing the same thing every time for everyone, 90%, only 10% of people who are trained to love God, who are yeah. talking about the Good Samaritan, stop in a high hurry category. So the question is, what is going on there? What they wrote, uh, one of the commenters said, you know, hurry isn't of the devil, it is the devil. And meaning that in this case, here's people who want to love, who are thinking about loving, who don't love because of hurry in their life. Yeah. I know that's definitely me sometimes. We've talked about this, where sometimes I'm so hurrying to get to a new activity to have a meaningful impact or to shoot another video, or I'm hurrying to the airport, you know, for something meaningful to go see my kids, that I will have to step over conversations where people needed me desperately. And yeah. I'm definitely in that kind So anyway, what I loved about this study was that you could literally see how hurry got in the way. And what they argue for is that this is, uh, when we're in a state of hurry, I love these, these words, and, um, that it's a narrowing of the cognitive map. What that means is it's a narrowing of all these options your brain thinks about for the world. Oh, that's good. Down to that yeah. one thing and we miss out on helping the person on the side of the road. Oh, that's good, that's good. And you know, here's what I'm thinking about as you share that, Sean, is you know, without the context and the setup and all of those things, if you just told me that this seminary student and this seminary student they, they, they took different paths. One of them stopped to help and one of them didn't. We would say to the person who stopped to help, fill in the blank. They're a saint, they're compassionate, you know, fill in the blank. And we would say of the person who stepped over them, you know, they're, they're a jerk, they're selfish, they're a hypocrite, what, whatever. And of course, the reality is, is that either of those people could have been in 
in different different categories. We want to put all these labels on ourselves and other people based on their actions. And the reality is what this research is showing to is that actually the only descriptor that would be accurate is that this person was hurried and this person wasn't. It's not necessarily this person was a, was, a, was a jerk and this person's a saint. And that tells me something about, about myself. I mean, it, it's not that, that in this particular moment, I'm awesome in this particular moment, I'm, 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 I'm terrible. What, what I can, but what I can control is, is the pace that I'm, that I'm moving at. And I'm more likely to show compassion. That's within, what'd you call it? The cognitive that Narrowing framework. of the cognitive the, map. The map, the cognitive map. Hey, it's, it, it's, it's, it's wider when I'm, going more slowly. I love Comer's language about moving at the speed of love because mm. love requires us to go at a more steady pace. You can, you can hate in a hurry. You can hate in a hurry, but you got to slow down. You got to slow down to love. So thanks for sharing that. That's good. Any other, we'll, we'll kind of wrap this up, but any other thoughts on um, Comer's work or just this idea in general about how fast we're moving right now? I think the challenge for me, I heard one time about this monk who, I don't remember, some, in some book, I think, uh, maybe Brothers Karamazov, you might know it better, somebody who wanted to be close to God, so who wanted to pray all the time, um, and then people would come up to meet the monks who needed prayers or healing or whatever it is they were coming to the monastery for, and the person wanted to be praying all the time, they didn't have time to ha talk to all these people. Um, and they said, if you're too busy to help other people, you're too busy to pray, <laughs> right? And I, oh, I've good. said that- I don't a, know that, that's good, yeah. A secular context in my life, I feel like if I'm too busy, I say it, let, let's take it down a notch. If I'm too busy to work out, then I'm too busy to, uh, uh, or if I'm too busy to exercise, then I'm too busy because that's key to my health long-term, right? So it's like one of my triggers uh, within my life. But if I'm too busy to not, pray or to be go to church or to read the Bible, then I'm too busy, right? Like that's that's the cutoff. I think where it becomes challenging for me is where we get a real conflict where, let's take your life, Matt, you, you could set up meetings all the time, right? With people who need you. And then you're like, well, I'm only talking to one person in this meeting, right? I should be giving a sermon talking to a mm -hmm. hundred people. And then I should be on Instagram talking to a thousand people, wh whatever it is, you know, like, what you're chasing is love. I, I think the challenge for me, like that I keep thinking through these things is, um, I wanna add to my life and add to the ways that I help other people, which adds hurry to my life. So the question the, then is where, uh, what is the way that I can diagnose whether or not I'm hurrying and it's getting the way of loving? Or if I hurry, I might love more people. Yeah. So how do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean. This is probably a pretty good way to wrap up. I mean, looking at, at the man himself, I mean, looking at Jesus's life, I mean, you know, you don't see this initially, but if you read between the lines, what you begin to notice is that a lot of Jesus's ministry happens because he stops what he's doing. Like at one point, you got a man who comes up, his son is sick, and he's like, come with me. And Jesus is like, all right, let's go. And they're on their way. And while they're on their way, a woman you know, stops and, and touches him and he, he feels, you know, energy go out of him and she's healed and he stops and, and talks with her. And it's this beautiful moment where he's doing some teaching and he's healing this woman and all those things. And what, what you miss is that you've got an anxious father a few steps away, you know, tapping his foot, like we got to, we got to go, you know, but Jesus, for whatever reason, discerned in that moment. No, I, this is interrupting what I had planned, but this is actually exactly where I need to be right now. And then of course, even he, he, he heals that young man um, also. But what I've found in my life is that if I'm really trying to be faithful in each individual moment, that if I don't have as much sermon prep time as I had hoped for that week, things tend to work out. Like God tends to fill that gap. Now, if I don't take as much sermon prep time because I'm kind of slacking off or I'm distracted or th that things don't work out those, those Sundays. Right. Um, but I, I, I think for me, at least I feel that tension all the time, Sean, I know that you do too. We've talked about it before. Um, 
it really is. I had until this morning on my whiteboard, I, I, I erased it. Um, the reminder to do the right thing that's right in front of you. I'm always thinking about what's next on my schedule and all those things. And sometimes something pops up that's the right thing right in front of you. And I want to be the kind of person that does the right thing right in front of me, even if it doesn't line up with my agenda. And I just know if I'm going fast, I blow right by that right thing. Connected to that, if I'm drinking a lot of coffee, I mean, I especially in the afternoon, I am so keyed up that I'm going way too fast. And I'm missing things that maybe God is calling me to do um, right in front of me. So, Sean, this, is, this has been a great conversation. It's been helpful to me. I think it'll be helpful to, to, to the people that watch this. Um, if anybody watches it, you know, you know, the three people on Instagram that follow me, if they, if they watch this, Sean, we're, we've made an impact today. That's our, note so. of meaning, that's our note of meaning today. My mom and my mother-in-law, their <laughs> lives are going to be better. Uh, today. So, um, well, John, I, I just appreciate you and I appreciate your, your work. And like I said, if, if you're not familiar with Sean's work, you need to check it out. It will make an impact in your life has made an impact um, in mine. So thanks for your time, Sean. Any kind of closing thoughts? No, this, I, I think it's so helpful. You're right. I started doing those micro prayers that you and Andrew yeah. Beard talked about. And I felt like when I pray in the morning, I start feeling like I see these opportunities, like that map widens. So it's just a reminder that I want to take that time to do that. And I think that would hurry less than the rest of my life and then and find the meaning we're supposed to you right now. So thank That's you. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Micro prayers, little prayers throughout the day. A lot of times we think that we have to sit down for 10 or 15 minutes, micro prayers, little prayers throughout the day. Andrew Beard, friend of Sean and ours, of mine, and uh, he's now the pastor at uh, the chapel at Seaside. So if you're ever in Seaside, Go see Andrew and Sarah Beard uh, at the chapel there. So, all right, God bless you, Sean. God bless you, friends. And keep up with this study. Um, I think it's making an impact on a lot of people's lives. Hopefully, you're one of those individuals. And um, if there's anything that you want to discuss further, again, I'm going to be doing these videos a couple times a week. You can drop some stuff in the comment section or send me a message, and that will give me some ideas about what to go after next time. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.